Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Arabella and I'm from Washington State and have lived in this exquisitely beautiful part of the world all of my life. I had an incredible encounter with a female Bigfoot in 2001 and in truth I never envisaged that I would ever share my story with anyone. You see, my husband and I are very private, discreet, unassuming people who hate and loathe the idea of ever having the spotlight focused on ourselves and we are camera shy as well. We prefer to hide in the shadows much like Bigfoot and remain elusive and inconspicuous, but in an anonymous forum like this, I really felt I wanted to share my story with you and your listeners. I am desirous and eager for people to know that Bigfoot is indeed real, and that some of these hairy humanoids will drop anything to help us in a moment of need, and that certainly happened in my case. I believe that they really and truly are the guardians of the forest. And while I appreciate that they may be aggressive, violent and dangerous Bigfoot out there, I also know that the reverse is most certainly true. Well, that is my experience anyway. In the year 1990, I got married to my very cautious, assiduous and shrewd husband, Paul, whom I'd been dating for over three years before he finally popped the question to me. I was over the moon when he proposed to me because the first time that I met my husband I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with him. I'm impulsive, capricious, impetuous and headstrong but my fastidious and prudent husband treads very slowly and cautiously so even his parents were absolutely amazed and perturbed that he'd asked me to marry him because he's so methodical and judicious, always slow when it comes to making any decisions so his marriage proposal was indeed fast work for him. We moved into a beautiful home in Washington that was indicative of the Cape Cod style architecture and was just so perfect for a newly married couple with really beautiful panoramic views and a really stunning front and back yard with the most pristine green turf and a scattering of impressive trees from ponderosa pines, cedars and spruces including two gigantic imposing statuesque oak trees that really caught my eye because they're easily over 300 years old. My husband teases me tirelessly and tells me I fell passionately in love with the oak trees long before the house, and hand on heart, he's probably right. Soon after my husband and I were married, he bought a brand new addition to our home, a beautiful golden retriever we call Butterscotch. She was the cutest, fluffiest thing you've ever seen in your life, and she was like this ball of long, very luxurious strawberry blonde hair. Before long, Butterscotch became steadfastly loyal and staunchly committed to my husband, following him everywhere like a loyal, devoted companion or a guide dog for the blind, as he was so bonded and attached to Paul. Paul fortunately worked from home, and so Butterscotch would loaf around, lying at his feet like a very luxurious foot warmer. If he went to the shops, Butterscotch would pop into the back of the trunk and wait for him to complete his shopping. My husband is a child psychologist that sees children from all walks of life and backgrounds, some who come from wealthy homes and others impoverished, but all have one thing in common. They're exceedingly troubled, disturbed and unhinged. 
My husband began to introduce butterscotch into these sessions to calm the kids down and it worked like a dream. It all actually started quite by accident and was never premeditated or pre-planned on my husband's part. Butterscotch just insisted on joining the sessions, so my husband reluctantly agreed, as she'd pour at the door and whine unless she was let into the office. My husband insisted she just laid at his feet. Soon he began to notice and discern that the kids tended to open up much more easily and were able to articulate, express and showcase their feelings more when Butterscotch was around. They would stroke her long golden hair and ask my husband all about her. He would talk to them about Butterscotch, and while they stroked her, he would cautiously, slowly, but very easily, ease his way forwards with questions, and the kids were so relaxed that instead of clamming up like a tight oyster shell, they spontaneously just talked. Some of the kids my husband sees have come from very abused backgrounds, or they've been traumatised by a dreadful event in their lives that has impacted them quite dramatically and so it can be like extracting blood out of a stone at the best of times to get them to say anything. I think Butterscotch sensed that they were tormented kids and loved interacting with them and sensing that they needed her help. She loved and delighted in helping them heal. I really believed she sensed these kids needed love. She would always be thrilled to see them, and a little rambunctious and gregarious perhaps, joyfully thumping her tail with unrestrained enthusiasm and wiggling her body in delight whilst regarding them through dark, cheerful eyes that would melt the hardest of hearts. I marvelled at how seamlessly she exhibited affection to these tortured and fearful souls. It seemed people were astounded at my husband's unique progress in getting through to these problematic kids at the best of times, but he believes emphatically that Butterscotch facilitated his success. One day Butterscotch began to behave very strangely in an abnormal, anomalous way. We noticed she kept pawing my husband's crotch over and over again and barking at it as if it was an unwanted stranger in our home that needed to leave at once. She would put the pad of her paw on his crotch area, retreat and bark at it, and then repeat the same action over and over again as if she was trying to communicate something of grievous concern to her that really was worrying. This peculiar behaviour went on for an entire week and set Paul's nerves on edge creating feelings of trepidation and apprehension. He sensed something was inherently wrong and was absolutely convinced that Butterscotch was trying to tell him something about his health. So he booked a consultation followed by tests with a local doctor and we discovered my husband had prostate cancer. In short, thanks to Butterscotch's early detection of my husband's cancer, he was able to make a full recovery and is now cancer-free. It was an incredible miracle, given Paul had an aggressive form of cancer, so Butterscotch categorically saved my husband's life. On one occasion in 2003, Paul did some yard work and slipped in the backyard over a wet stone, breaking his ankle very badly in several places, and Butterscotch came running into the house and began to paw me urgently and bark. I proceeded to follow her and found my husband under a tree in agonising pain in need of immediate medical attention. Once again, Butterscotch had come to his rescue. So the bond between my husband and Butterscotch was extraordinary. My husband would go the extra mile to buy her a fillet steak or cook her up some chicken breasts because he wanted to give back to the dog that had given him so much and, in a nutshell, saved his life. One day when we were having a delicious barbecue in our backyard with friends of ours, my friend's four-year-old daughter suddenly fell into the pool. We never actually saw a thing as we were so distracted and caught off guard by our conversation. We hadn't even observed the toddler waddling off, but Butterscotch had seen everything and began to bark to warn us before she actually fell into the pool, but we weren't paying any attention. Paul was in our cellar at the time with his friend Keith, discussing wines, so he never saw anything either. We were all alerted to the loud splash when Butterscotch dived into the pool and pulled the little girl out of the water with her jaws pulling the dress and dragging her out of the water. At first we thought Butterscotch was playing with a doll, until we realised with horror that it was actually my friend's kid. My friend went hysterical and furious with herself for not seeing her daughter waddling off to the water. You just have to lose focus for a moment, and accidents invariably happen. My friend was so thrilled with what Butterscotch had done that she bought him a week's supply of fillet steak to thank him for the rescue. One day in 1989, we noticed that Butterscotch seemed out of sorts and had been vomiting quite badly, and we were about to take her to the vet, but we found her lying dead in the bushes. 
It had been such a quick death. One minute she was throwing up, and the next minute she was dead. I mean, how does that happen? It naturally broke our hearts, and my husband was inconsolable and shattered. He was so cut up that he barely said a word for an entire week. He looked so crushed and desolate without butterscotch in his life. It was like he'd lost a part of himself, and the house lacked the gentle patter of butterscotch's feet and the golden hair that flopped out of the floor lying next to him. We never did find out what killed her, because my husband refused to have his beautiful beloved dog cut up for an autopsy. We buried her in our garden and put up a little stone in her precious memory. It said, Butterscotch, rest in peace, my precious treasured friend. You are missed and forever loved and esteemed. One day my husband and I decided to go for an implantation, as before his prostate cancer, some of his sperm was frozen for when we decided to start a family. And within a short period of time I was pregnant, and we were overjoyed and elated with the good news. As you can imagine, I was decorating a nursery which I decided to paint bright yellow with pretty sunflowers because I wasn't sure whether we were going to have a girl or a boy, and I didn't want to know either, so yellow was a safe option. My pregnancy was very difficult and turbulent because I suffered from terrible morning sickness every single day, and my feet would swell up so badly in the afternoons, and I became exceedingly tired. One morning a friend of mine popped over spontaneously for tea, and she commented on how sad and empty our house had become without butterscotch. You really should get another golden retriever, she told me. You need some life back in this house of yours. It feels like a mausoleum in here. It's so deathly quiet and woefully depressing. Your house is lacking the exuberant energy it once had when butterscotch was around. I would get a golden retriever, but Paul can't go through the pain of losing another animal. He's so cut up and distraught over losing butterscotch. That's so ridiculous, said my friend. Would Paul rather not have had Butterscotch's presence in this house so he could have avoided grieving her passing? Of course not, I said. Butterscotch is the very best thing that happened to Paul. The dog saved his life. Well, there you are. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I promise you never a truer word was ever spoken. He's missing out on the love of another dog that could potentially bring him so much joy because of the fear of it dying. It's an established fact, unfortunately, that dogs have shorter lives than we do, but not to have an animal for that reason is crazy. He's missing out on so much. You know you're right, I said. Of course I'm right. You should buy him a dog, and the moment he sees the pup, he won't be able to resist that bouncy ball of golden fluff and those dark eyes looking at him with such love. Golden retrievers make the cutest puppies. You've got to get him another one. You know what? I am. I'm going to get him another puppy. Good. I'm glad to hear it, she said. So that was when I decided to research Butterscotch's family line and see if any of his descendants had had pups. And imagine my surprise when I discovered that there was one girl pup left that was from Butterscotch's family line. I mean, it didn't get better than that, and I was so excited and informed the breeder I'd be taking the last dog that they had left, which was a little girl. But should you not see the puppy first, she protested, to be sure it's the one for you. If it's related to butterscotch, I'm taking it, I told her. We arranged for me to pick it up at 5.30 that afternoon. I'm afraid I live off the beaten track, the woman told me, giving me her directions. Make sure you don't take the wrong turning, because you could end up in the middle of nowhere. I proceeded to scroll down the directions, but the one thing about being pregnant is you seem to have a mind like a sieve and become ditzy and unmindful, it's almost like you're actively losing brain cells. It's an established fact that women become much more clumsy, imprudent and infinitely more stupid. I had noticed during my pregnancy that I was increasingly bemused, forgetful and absent-minded. I must confess, hand on heart, that I was doing some really idiotical and bird brain things. I kid you not, when I came home from shopping at Walmart one day, I literally put my husband's new underwear in the refrigerator and the yogurts and cheese in my husband's underwear drawer. I remember Paul was very surprised and perturbed to find his underwear drawer loaded with strawberry yogurts along with blue cheese and camembert, and it all smelt decidedly cheesy. I also became increasingly cloddish and butter-fingered with everything, breaking things in an ungainly, bungling way like dinner plates and glasses that literally slid out of my hands at random and shattered on the floor, and it happened over and over again. I wanted the new exciting addition to our family to be a great, big, marvellous surprise and bright star for Paul. 
I knew once I brought the puppy home that Paul would be smitten and beguiled by the sweet little thing. In my gut it seemed the right thing to do to get another golden retriever. Goodness, we needed the pitter-patter of soft paws running around our empty home that seemed devoid of any life. I remember it was about four o'clock when I told Paul I was visiting my friend Jane for coffee and a chat. So late, he said, looking at me with a baffled, bemused expression on his face. Should you not be resting so close to your delivery date, rather than gallivanting around this late in the afternoon, just to see your friend Jane? Are you not being a little reckless? Everything's fine, I told him. It's just a quick chat, that's all. Jane needs my advice about something very important. I think she should come here, said Paul, not the other way round. I think it's a bit selfish of her taking advantage of you like this, so close to your due date. I'm going, I said, and that's final. My husband watched me leave in my car with a rather solicitous look on his face. I could tell he wasn't very happy, but things would change when our new addition arrived, and I couldn't wait to see the smile on Paul's face when he first laid eyes on the adorable golden pup. In a trice I was on my way driving down one dirt road to another. The breeder was absolutely right. She did live in the middle of nowhere. Once I'd left the highway and driven over a long bridge, I found myself driving through an exquisite mountainous area where I passed sumptuous forests and tall alpine trees, rocky outcrops and large silvery lakes that glistened in the late afternoon sun. I remember after taking several turnings, my car suddenly stalled in the middle of the dirt road and then it stopped completely. Of course, I remembered, I'd forgotten to fill up with petrol. It was the very first thing I'd meant to do leaving the house, and even my warning light had been showing. What was I thinking? Why was I so vague, dopey and disorientated? It seemed like I was always forgetting things and becoming a complete scatterbrain. I reached for my cell phone to call Paul to rescue me by bringing me some petrol. I knew he'd be telling me off for leaving the house so heavily pregnant and getting myself stranded like this. Still, I had to face his reproval since I had even forgotten the petrol. I felt embarrassed and really silly. I discovered to my horror that I couldn't get a cell phone reception or signal in the mountains, and I was now beginning to realise that I really was in a quandary and faced with a huge conundrum. I groaned. I now knew I needed to walk down some of those country roads to find my way to a main road so that I could flag someone down to give me a lift or to see if I could finally get a cell phone signal somewhere else. I reluctantly locked my car door behind me and proceeded to walk, which wasn't easily being so heavily pregnant, as I was lumbering along like a huge hippo, staggering over the rocky roads. This was not going to be easy. Why on earth had I been so reckless? I began to become weary and tired, and I sat down under the shade of a large alder tree for the moment, just to take a breather. Suddenly I began to feel some twinges in my stomach, and then to my horror my waters broke. Oh no! This couldn't be happening right now. I was a week early from my due date, but it seemed like my baby had other ideas in its mind, and it was all eager to be born. But why now, of all things? The twinges increased in intensity, and that was when I realised I couldn't walk any further. I noticed that I was surrounded by mountains, and I was in an open clearing on a grassy verge that was flanked by statuesque towering trees. If that wasn't bad enough, I noticed the sky had darkened and a pretty sunset had developed over the valley in exquisite golds, tangerines and oranges. Yes, it was magnificent, but hardly something I could appreciate when beginning to feel the sensations of further contractions, and they were increasingly more regular. I think all the walking had somehow made things happen so much faster for me. I began to feel defenceless and endangered because I was out here in the wild without a single solitary soul in sight to help me and I felt very alone, assailable and afraid. Suddenly I saw something moving between the trees that looked like a dark, threatening, shadowy form and I sensed that whatever it was, it was watching me and an overwhelming, panicking feeling of impending dread overcame me. My heart began to pump very fast. I was sweating profusely and breathing very heavily. I became very discomposed and alarmed. I sensed that there was a predator loitering around, and there was nothing I could do to escape should it launch a full-scale attack on me. Suddenly the shooting pain became very intense, and I actually began to scream loudly as I tried to remember the breathing techniques I'd learnt. The only way I can describe the pain to you was as if knives were stabbing my torso and tearing the skin apart. I began to feel these incredible cramps that were unlike anything that I've ever experienced before. They were appallingly painful. 
I almost felt as if I was going to die, and as if my stomach was about to burst open. It was the worst pain I have ever felt, and I doubled over in agony, clenching my stomach and holding on to a tree trunk for support. Suddenly I turned around, and standing behind me was this towering giant. This was all I needed. I was so shocked by what I was seeing and discerning that in that moment I forgot my pain just for a second. Yet once again my body was being disturbed and bombarded and immobilised by the violent punches jolting and pounding my stomach again. And once again I doubled over in pain, barely noticing the critter behind me. To my absolute astonishment and amazement, this female humanoid covered in long flowing hair that looked like she was half human and half ape began to assist me and actually help me. I realised she was female because she seemed to know what was happening to me and wanted to help. In that moment, the fear just dissipated because I knew I wasn't alone and the creature was so kind that I knew I was in safe hands. She seemed to know exactly what she was doing. She patted the ground and pushed me down on my derriere and began to open and part my legs for me. She kept looking between my legs to see if she could see anything coming out. Every time I screamed, she patted my back several times for reassurance as she tried to encourage me. Finally, I felt the overwhelming sensation that I needed to push and the critter became very excited and kept indicating by her actions that I needed to push further. It was so strange, but there was no language spoken between us, but I understood what she was saying perfectly. Once I began to push, I did feel a huge, monumental sense of relief, and it seemed like my baby was entering the birth canal very speedily, and when the critter saw the head, she began to chat away very excitedly and encouraging me to push even more. Her enthusiasm was very infectious. Finally, my baby was delivered, and the hairy humanoid broke the cord using a stone, and then she handed me my baby, and I do not know who was more thrilled, her or me. I watched in amazement as the critter began jumping up and down with such ecstatic delight. I held the baby for a moment and it began to cry. I realised I delivered a beautiful baby girl. And then I delivered the placenta, which was much more painful than the birth itself. And the hairy humanoid offered it to me as if she thought I would eat it. But in my body language I told her categorically that I didn't want it. The critter put it to one side and took a piece of it off and began to eat it. It was like she was saying to me, it's really good. I could tell she liked the taste of it. I tried to clean up my baby with my dress, but the critter pointed towards a stream and took my baby there for a quick wash and returned it to me completely cleaned up. We sat together for a long while and the critter did not leave my side. She was very protective towards me and was desirous to keep me very safe. I studied her curiously and I would say she was about six foot tall, five hundred pounds and two foot wide and was covered in pretty auburn hair. The creature had long arms, strong powerful legs and was muscular. Her head was shaped like a dome and she had very attractive oval face with very kind deep set toffee coloured eyes and a prominent wrinkled brow ridge, a flat nose and a thin mouth. She wasn't bad looking as odd as that sounds and I thought she possessed the most gentle nature. I pointed to my baby and to her as I tried to ask her if she'd had any children of her own because she seemed to know a lot about pregnancy. She collected two stones and pointed to the two stones and I assumed she was saying that she'd had two and then she indicated that she had one girl and one boy. It was so strange how we could communicate so much without speaking each other's language and before long I was talking away to her while I rocked my baby in my arms. Sometimes she would take my baby from me and rock her as well. I could see that she loved babies and was very maternal. She pointed to my baby and me and I sensed she was saying she looks exactly like you. I checked for a signal on my cell phone that was in my pocket but there was absolutely nothing. I began to feel very frustrated because how on earth was I going to get out of here? Suddenly I heard the sound of a car not too far away and I could hear a woman's voice saying Hello, is anybody there? The hairy humanoid indicated for me to go and she walked behind me at a distance, moving from one tree to another. It seemed like she was hiding in the shadows, but checking on me to see if I was safe. Then I saw the woman ambling towards me, and she stopped short in amazement when she saw my baby and gasped. You've just given birth, she gasped, all on your own out here in the middle of nowhere, haven't you? That's right, I said, I have. Are you sure you're all right? Should I not call an ambulance? No, I assured her. 
I'm absolutely fine. I can't believe you gave birth out here all on your own. It must have been painful and scary. Believe me, it was, but it could have been a lot worse, I assured her. You're Arabella, is that right? Yes, I am. Are you the breeder? I'm the breeder, she laughed. I came to look for you because when I didn't get a response from you on your cell, I thought you must have taken the wrong turning. So I came to look for you. I saw your empty car, but you weren't there, and I imagined you were trying to get a signal on your cell phone and had wandered off. It's not the first time this has happened to one of my customers. Out here in the mountains, the signals are all blocked off, I'm afraid. It's worse than taking the wrong turning, I said. I have to admit I ran out of petrol as well. I completely forgot to fill up my tank before I left. Oh, you're exactly like me, dear. When I was pregnant, my brain turned to jello, and I forgot absolutely everything, she laughed. The breeder took me back to her home to clean up and to have a shower and retrieve my puppy, and then dropped me off at my home with a new puppy and my baby. Luckily, her husband brought my car back for me, filled with petrol. Paul nearly passed out in shock when I arrived home with a golden ball of fluff that looked like butterscotch when she was small, and, of course, my recently born baby girl. He described it as one of the weirdest and most wondrous days of his life. When I told my husband what had transpired and where I'd actually given birth in the middle of nowhere after my car ran out of petrol and about my bizarre outlandish encounter with a hairy humanoid, he couldn't make sense of my strange incredulous story or what on earth it was that I'd encountered because there weren't many accounts in those days of Bigfoot. I know Bigfoot helped me deliver a healthy seven-pound, two-ounce baby girl that I called Victoria because it was indeed a victorious delivery. I'm still so grateful she helped me, as being unchaperoned, delivering a baby in the middle of nowhere has got to be the most terrifying experience. She helped me to feel that I was not companionless, and that meant the world to me. I went on to have two more girls called Lucy and Julia. The golden retriever brought home for Paul was called Daisy, and she lived for 14 long years and my husband adored her. Of course, she was a different personality to Butterscotch, but equally as lovable and special in her own way. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Rolf, and I'm from Colorado Springs, which is a city in the eastern foot of the Rocky Mountains, well known for the famous Pike Peak, which is the highest summit here of over 14,000 feet and a renowned landmark in Pike's Natural Forest, where you'll find plenty of hiking trails and a cog railway. Then let me not forget to mention the city that houses the Garden of the Gods, that features the most exquisite red sandstone formations, which many visitors to our part of the world find incredibly beguiling and bedazzling. And indeed they are, as they're so unique and incredibly rare. We have what I would describe as cooler, drier winters, a semi-arid kind of climate, so to speak, as the Chinook winds naturally afford a rapid warming influence over Colorado Springs, which does have a tendency to bring us variable, changing weather conditions. I grew up in the Black Forest area, which is heavily forested on the northeastern side of Colorado Springs, in an older home situated on three acres of land. Living out here does feel like you're living in the middle of the countryside, yet in reality the main town is only about ten minutes a drive away, which isn't very far. We live in an old house that was built in the 1900s, but was restored and renovated in 1989, and my family finally brought the house in 1995, and we subsequently moved in and never ever looked back, as we enjoyed living in such an idyllic part of the world. Our house was symmetrical in design, with two storeys, large windows, and a very attractive wraparound porch. We also had stables where we accommodated our three horses and took regular daily rides on many riding trails in the area, which was and is still very forested, hence the name Black Forest. I grew up here with my two sisters, Kirsten and Gretchen, and both of my parents. Growing up, my best friend Nick lived about an hour and 40 minutes drive away from me in Denver. I'd spend many exciting, memorable daredevil weekends at his home with his fun-loving father. His father was a proficient and skilled hunter and generously took us out regularly on hunting excursions. He taught and mentored us both from a very young age of about 11 under his strict parental supervision and guidance. He taught us everything we needed to know about hunting and it became a huge passion for the both of us. Much as I adored my sisters, growing up Nick was like the brother I never had and I enjoyed spending time with him as we had so much in common with similar boyish interests that girls never really understood. 
Not to put too fine a point on it, of course. Nick simply refused to come and stay at my home again after he visited me and stayed over for the weekend once. Even to this day, he describes it as the most distressing, terrifying night of his entire life that he would never like to repeat again at any cost. It all started when we both decided to go snooping around the Lee residence near Swan Road in the early evening on our bicycles. My good-natured parents, whom are chilled, easy-going, laid-back kind of people, encourage us to let our hair down, so we were almost footloose and fancy-free to do what we liked. Well, almost. Our neighbourhood in those days was considered very safe, so they were nonchalant about us taking a quick bicycle ride in the early evening, provided we had our lights on and wore our helmets, which we invariably always did. I told my agreeable parents I wanted to show Nick the Lee house, which was the sighting of all kinds of very inscrutable, enigmatic, unexplained paranormal activities that were arousing a great deal of interest from television studios and paranormal researchers around North America at the time. They were doing reports and case studies on all the esoteric happenings at the Lee residence. Are you interested in the paranormal? my mother asked Nick curiously. I am curious, Nick told her but I'm not sure I believe in all that stuff. I would have to see something before I actually believed it, but I guess I'm open-minded enough to be persuaded. I think you could describe me as somewhat intrigued. Well, if you're going to see anything supernatural and outer-worldly, the Lee place is a very good place to start. There's been a lot of interest in the place recently, said my mother. I have a girlfriend who knows the family personally, and she told me that they're not making things up because she has seen for herself and heard very strange, ambiguous things at that house that cannot be explained and naturally defy rational explanation. Like what, Mum? I asked. Well, she said she saw these obscure, physical, opaque-like shadows that had a human-like shape to them. They appeared very menacing and they were darting around the Lee's front yard. She said that they seemed intelligent and very aware, but also disturbing because they weren't like your normal shadow people, they were something else. They had distinct humanoid, three-dimensional shapes that were blurred and hazy, and very obscure. She couldn't describe them exactly, but I could see by the discomposed expression on her face that she had really been rattled by the outlandish, incomprehensible phenomenon, whatever on earth it was. Do you believe her? I asked. Well, I don't see why I shouldn't believe her, darling, my mother said. But I haven't ever believed in the paranormal myself before, but then I do trust my friend's undetermined account, so I'm on the fence about it, I'm afraid. My mother went on to tell us exactly what she knew about the place. Everyone who lives in our area knows about the alleged paranormal activity that takes place in the Lee House, she explained. Even the most hardened sceptics and cynics have visited the place, looking to debunk the indeterminate claims but they come away saying that there's something outer-worldly going on there. Some people describe the Lee House as one of the most haunted houses here in America, if not the world. One shaman, I gather, recently described it as being located on a rainbow vortex, which becomes like a railway road for the paranormal, that apparently can slip in and out of our reality at random. Then there are the strange stories about the Lees actually witnessing extraordinary ethereal light shows, I gather they came back one night, and Mrs. Lee described it as like Fourth of the July firework displays. They also heard eerie rustling chains on the roof at night, rattling away and making a very strange commotion, and they even heard celestial orchestra music, and I gather saw metaphysical shadows and spectral beings and mystical moving lights. So I don't know what is going on there. As you know, there is a military presence there, that does a great deal of testing in our area, and even Mr. Lee himself, who's the biggest cynic of them all, was very concerned about all that military activity going on, and believed that in some way it could be connected to the military experiments that they were doing, and believes it might include psychic mind control or something, so no one really knows what is going on there. So that's about all I know, really, about the place, but I think it's a good idea for you kids to go and have a look, but make sure you're back within an hour, because I'll be coming looking for you if you're not, and that's a promise. Before long, Nick and I were on our bikes, riding towards the Lee house, ringing our bicycle bells enthusiastically. I was feeling very excited about the prospect of seeing something anomalous with Nick, 
As to be honest, I'd never really dared to visit the Lee place on my own, as although curious, I was not that brave. Your parents are so cool, said Nick. I don't know if my parents would let me go out early in the evening on my bike. Well, if you want to see something haunted, it has to be at night, I insisted. Isn't that when all the ghoulies and ghosts come out to play, I teased. Well, if I'm being honest, said Nick, hand on heart, I wouldn't really mind seeing something. Actually, I'd quite like it. We can't go into the Lee property, though, I warned, as they do have security cameras up. But we can have a look around the area, and that's about as good as it gets, I'm afraid. We stopped our bicycles and stared into the property, and although it was quite dark, we could see that it was a very large log home flanked by a few ponderosa pines and large areas of expansive turf. It looked disappointingly normal to Nick, and I could tell by the downcast expression on his face that he was expecting something a lot more sinister, shady and creepy. It doesn't even look remotely haunted to me, he complained bitterly. I thought you were going to take me to some spine-chilly, spooking, nightmarish place. But this could be anybody's log home. It's not even foreboding or ugly, and it hardly even looks haunted. I'm sorry, I said. It's a standard home that's haunted, I suppose. I never knew you were expecting something so blatantly unnerving that gave you the chills. I don't think it works like that with haunted houses, you know. Are you not supposed to get a creepy vibe from a house that's haunted, said Nick, looking decidedly disenchanted. I suppose so, I said, feeling disappointed that my very best friend was clearly unimpressed and disillusioned by the Lee home. I wanted to show him a good time while he was staying at my place, and I was failing miserably in my entertainment. I tell you what, I said, trying to lift up the mood. Why don't we cycle around the wooded area before we go back home? I've heard speculation from people around here that they've seen strange anomalies and light orbs in the woods. I'm not sure I want to go, he said. There's nothing out here for me. I don't believe in all that stuff anyway. I could tell he was so disappointed and vanquished, almost as if a small part of him really wanted to believe in the supernatural and that ghosts were indeed real. But now he was highly cynical about the matter and seemed rather disappointed. We were turning our bicycles on the road, and that was when Lee and I saw a figure walking directly towards us from the Lee house. He did not look best pleased with us, possibly because we were snooping. I felt like a kid that had been caught with my hand in the cookie jar, doing something very naughty. I didn't know who he was, for I'd never seen him before, but he was wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans, and looked like he wanted to punch our lights out. In truth, I've never actually seen anyone that looked so enraged and angry before. I felt frightened and discomposed by his aggressive demeanour towards us and his tempestuous manner. I suppose I couldn't blame him, really. I'm sure we weren't the first to go peeping and poking our noses around the Lee property after hearing rumours of the hauntings. Quick, said Nick, let's go. And we turned our bikes around as fast as we could, and that was when we could hear the indignant young man running after us. I was certain he was going to throttle us, and we sped away on our bicycles as fast as we possibly could. But despite our speed, he was only yards behind us. How could anyone be this fast, I wondered in horror. All the time we could hear his frenzied breathing behind us, as he ran after us. In terror, we quickly turned up our driveway at home, feeling absolutely petrified, with chills down our spine. But to our amazement and huge relief, the young man was gone. Where had he got to? We couldn't even imagine. But all we could think about was one thing, and that was hightailing it back into the house as fast as we possibly could. Did you see anything? asked my mother, looking at our pale faces as we bolted through the door like heavy, powerful windstorm as the door slammed violently behind us. No, we didn't see anything, but I think someone from the Lee family was chasing after us because we were encroaching by looking in on the property, and a young man living there chased after us on our bikes. He looked as mad as hell, like a rabid dog foaming at the mouth. It freaked us out and scared us stiff. Well, that's a bit mean of him, said my mother. I think he's overreacting, I really do. It's only natural to be a bit curious about a haunted place, and you're only meddling kids having a little snoop. What's wrong with that? It's only a bit of harmless fun, surely. Well, 
They've probably had enough of inquisitive, nosy people snooping around the place, hoping to spot something anomalous, said my father. I can't blame them. If I had people officiously sizing up my property all the time because of ghostly rumours, I'd do my nut. The poor man possibly had as much as he could take of the incessant scrutiny. How can you blame them for that? Later that evening, Nick and I sat down to watch a hilarious movie, and we ate some pizza delivery my mother had ordered for us, and then we retired to our beds with thoughts of the hair-raising, terrorising bicycle chase now long behind us. Don't you think it was odd, though, that the man was chasing us? He just vanished like that, said Nick, as we began to retire to bed. I mean, he was breathing behind us, and then he was suddenly gone. Now, you have to admit, that was rather weird. I think he was just trying to scare us, but I must admit he did get away very fast. Well, he certainly did that, said Nick. I can't remember being so freaked out before. Well, you got the scare you were looking for then, I teased. Before long, we'd fallen asleep, and I was suddenly awoken to Nick shaking me violently. Get up, get up, get up, he said. Yes, what is it? He was here, said Nick. He was here, right here. Who was here, I asked. The young man. You know the one we sought at this, this evening? The one in the plaid shirt and the blue jeans? You are kidding, I said. Did he break into our house? No, said Nick. He was sitting right here at the end of my bed. He was smoking a cigarette and looking at me with vindictive, hateful eyes. You are kidding, I said. I'm going to have to tell Mum about this. You can't just go breaking into people's houses like this and lighting up cigarettes on people's beds. That's going way too far. I know we were snooping, but this is too much. No, no, you don't get it. I think he followed us here, said Nick. But he didn't break in. What do you mean he didn't break in? How did he get in in the first place? That's what I want to know. He's a ghost, said Nick, looking at me with wide eyes. And not a nice one either. What? I said. Are you kidding me? This is a joke, right? You are just having a laugh. No, I'm not, said Nick. He sat on the end of my bed, smoking and glaring at me. And then he faded and vanished in front of my eyes. He has to be a ghost. I was absolutely gobsmacked at the startling revelation and had no idea what to think. I knew Nick was not inclined to make things up. He had a lousy imagination at the very best of times and was pretty pathetic at pulling off a big stunt like this. I knew he had to be telling me the truth. That night, Nick absolutely insisted that we slept together with the lights on and was convinced that the man in the plaid shirt and the blue jeans was after him in some way. After that very strange, curious experience, he never stayed at my home again because his encounter with that ghost had absolutely terrified him. Even when he returned to Denver, he slept with the light on every night for three years after the incident. But all these years later, I'm amazed that I saw a ghost, because I promise you he looked so normal to me, and nothing about him made me doubt that he was not 100% real. Although the way he was running directly behind us on our bikes was decidedly odd and not natural, because no one can run that fast. I still never sensed anything outer-worldly about him, so I'm obviously not that sensitive to paranormal phenomena. So on to the next part of our incredible story that led to our extraordinary encounter with Bigfoot, Sasquatch or Yeti, if you like. This was when I was spending a week with Nick in Denver. We were determined to go hunting for elk, despite the heavy winter, perilous, somewhat treacherous conditions out there. There had been a ubiquitous amount of snowfall in the area where we were planning to go hunting. I must confess I felt very excited about going hunting again. It had been a while since I'd taken down a sizable elk. I fancied refining my shooting techniques, which were getting quite good lately. I think Nick and I were equally as exuberant and eager about returning to our favourite hunting lodge for that quintessential hunting experience, which every hunter enjoys. We arrived at the rustic, pastoral, rather charming hunting lodge later that afternoon. I would describe it as a rather magical, almost whimsical, quaint, rustic hunting lodge made from timber beams and sumptuously decorated with very cosy furnishings, large stone fireplaces throughout, filled with crackling, warm, hearty winter fires, drawing rooms filled with interesting walls of ancient-looking leather-bound books and mounted animal heads from elks to bears. 
Nick and I booked a sizable, well-appointed and stylish, eclectic-looking room, together with two single beds, and once we'd unpacked, we braced the cold weather for a quick scout around the place. We went investigating the extensive, variable terrain here, as we were well acquainted with the lodge. We came here often, so we were familiar with the layout of the land. Despite the freezing conditions, we heartily enjoyed our invigorating walk, scrunching the cold snow beneath our boots, while feeling the blistering cold wind blowing against our cheeks, which was punnelling quite savagely against our clothes. Despite the rough elements and challenging weather conditions, Nick and I were in no way discouraged, deterred or defeated. It would take a lot more than bad weather to disenchant us or disenfranchise us. Besides, everything was crisp and fresh and beautiful. It was like an enchanting, magical winter wonderland, as layers of thick white snow cloaked and carpeted the wilderness in a glistening, undulating fold of pretty white hillocks that looked like a sea of white moving waves. Even the mountains, hilly valleys and ragged outcrops were swathed in what I can only describe as the most gorgeous white icing on a Christmas cake, and icicles of pretty snow hung off the ponderosa pines and Douglas firs like fragile, dainty and delicate crystals. We began looking out for the perfect places to hunt. We glassed the entire area with our binoculars, and before long we found the perfect location where the elk were lying low. We had a general idea where we'd set up our blind for the morning's hunt. Nick and I had spotted a couple of sizable looking elk taking cover in a low valley against a mountainous ridge that I believe provided some kind of windbreak for them and insulation against the volatile, turbulent climate. We could only hope that the weather would actually improve. It looked like another snowstorm was brewing and we didn't want that to impact our morning's hunt as come hell or high water we were determined to go hunting come what may. At dinner that night we sat at a very long table full of hunting enthusiasts like ourselves, talking about how their week at the lodge had been going for them. Most complained bitterly that the conditions had been rather unpleasant for hunting, but nevertheless one or two of the hunters had been successful in taking down a couple of sizable elk. It seemed that most hunters were sympathetic to the plight of the animals, as they had seen how the animals can suffer in these brutal conditions without easy access to food. I was delighted to learn that one of the hunters had brought boxes and boxes of apples to leave out for the deer, struggling to find food in these winter conditions. We were also informed that the ranch owner also put out food for the indigenous wildlife, which pleased me greatly, as I hate to think of animals suffering in these freezing conditions. The following morning, after a hearty breakfast, Nick and I set out for the hunt, while the other hunters preferred to stay indoors until the weather improved significantly. Granted, it was rather windy, but I was eager to get the blind set up for the hunt, which we did so efficiently. Suddenly on the upper, treacherous ridge, I did discern two very dark silhouettes of men walking down from the sheer elevation. They looked like dark, moving shadows, gliding against the skyline. I wondered who on earth they were, and what they were doing at such a height, with such a mighty wind blowing in quite fiercely. Let's not kid, it can be precarious at the very best of times, and you would need to be steady-footed, agile and fit to manage walking on what I can only describe as a rocky tightrope against a punnelling windstorm that could easily blow you off the edge if you weren't very careful. They're completely mad, said Nick, fixing his camera on the men. Oh my God, Rolf, he said, looking at me directly. They're not human. What are you talking about, I said, snatching the binoculars from Nick quickly, even though I had my own. Nick was looking at me with a stupefied, agogged expression on his face, as if he couldn't believe what he'd actually been seeing. Oh, my word, I said, as I looked through the lens. I think it's Bigfoot. I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was discerning. We were both so fascinated by what we were observing that we crept forwards to where the strange novel creatures were finally appearing. I had a closer view of them. I don't think fear even entered our minds, not even for a moment. We were exceedingly curious, and my heart was pounding and beating vigorously, but not with anxiety or apprehension by, by any manner of means, but from sheer excitement. I simply couldn't wait to get a closer view of the uncharacteristic critters. Be careful not to be seen, I warned Nick. As the critters became closer into our view, they were swinging their arms and legs backwards and forwards, almost as though they were marching, but not quite. They seemed to be walking directly towards something with intentional purpose, as if they had a mission to accomplish. I observed that there was a large elk completely trapped in the snow, 
because I discerned its head above the snow, which would have been an easy meal for the Bigfoot. I watched them as they approached the large elk. It was sizable male, with very huge antlers, and was completely buried and submersed by the snow. It was clearly trapped, the poor thing. My binoculars were wobbling uncontrollably as I observed the scene unfolding before my eyes. The two Bigfoot were intent on digging out the elk, which I thought they were going to kill. Once they'd removed the snow, but that is not what they did. Instead, they set the elk free, and it scampered away happily to be freed from its confinement. I studied the incongruous critters closely, as they were indeed very arresting. I could see that they were both male, with powerful muscular ripped torsos and very large gargantuan shoulders with impressive bicep muscles. They were covered in long black flowing hair, and they had very long arms and powerful legs. I noted that the head was shaped rather like a dome, and literally sat on top of the head without the presence of a neck, much like an egg in a cup. At this point I could not see the faces very clearly, although I did discern that the skin was grey and leathery. Before long the critters glided away, and I thought we'd seen the last of them. I was so beguiled and bedazzled by what I'd seen, and somehow seeing the transfixing Bigfoot had stolen the thunder of the hunt, because all we could do was talk about the critters. We were also perturbed as to why these natural hunters had not killed the easy meal trapped in the snow, as it made no sense to me at all. Well, not at first, that is. Nick and I decided to continue with our hunt and made our way back to our blind. It was rather a long wait for any activity, and I was beginning to think we should call it a day, and then quite suddenly we saw a very substantial male elk coming within our shooting range, and I thought all my Christmases had come at once. I perceived that the elk was standing in the most quintessential spot, much like the bullseye in a dartboard. It couldn't get better than that. The sizable buck with his magnificent antlers looked around for a moment, sniffing the air, and then he started ferreting around the snow for what appeared to be some apples that had recently been thrown out into the area, which he began to chew. I focused with my Remington rifle on the creature and shot him directly in the heart, and he was down so fast. I was very impressed with my fine shot, even if I say so myself, because it was such a humane kill, which is something as a hunter very significant for me. The last thing I want to incur is an injured animal. You really have got a steady hand, said Nick, looking at me impressed. Now that was a fine shot and a fine buck with a very sizable rack. Suddenly we heard a strange sound. The only way I can describe it is something very big coming into our range of vision. Then we saw them. It was the two Bigfoot that we'd actually seen earlier on in the morning. They glided seamlessly and almost floated towards our dead elk, and one of them seized it by the hands and threw it over his shoulders as if it weighed absolutely nothing. Now these buck, or elk if you like, are very heavy, and this thing must have weighed at least 500 pounds at a guess, but then the male Bigfoot were easily over ten foot tall, probably a thousand pounds and three foot wide, so perhaps it wasn't a big deal to carry something half their weight. Even so, it was very impressive to behold, and I was blown away by the size of these Bigfoot. As close up, they were Herculean, and that's not a joke. One of the critters held my gaze for a moment, with dark, soulful brine eyes that looked directly at me. Then I noticed how human the face was, and discerned that the leathery skin was greyish in colour, with a distinct prominent brow ridge, flat nose, and very deep-set eyes. Both critters looked at us very briefly, and then they just glided away. It was as quick as that. "'What just happened there?' said Nick, looking really very surprised. "'They rescued an elk this morning that they could have easily killed, and then they stole owls. It doesn't make any sense at all. Why on earth would they do that? It seems incongruous.' "'Well, maybe it's not as odd as you actually think,' I said to Nick. "'Think about it for a moment. "'They showed compassion to that elk. "'They wanted to help it, not harm it. "'It had been through so much trauma already, "'being trapped in that snow, I imagine. "'It was a sitting duck for predators, "'with no hope on the horizon for it, "'its predetermined fate almost certainly sealed. "'As a hunter, I would personally not kill an elk "'stranded in the snow for those very same reasons.' I would rather rescue the animal and help it. I think once you start unshackling and releasing an animal from its enclosure that's been trapped in, you become somehow bonded to it in a very unconscious way, without even being aware of it. It makes every human being feel good about themselves to help something in trouble. 
Given that the Bigfoot are almost certainly half human, why would it feel any different for them to rescue an animal? I actually think they relished and enjoyed setting that elk free. For me, it would be intrinsically wrong to shoot an elk in that kind of situation. It wouldn't feel right, and it would seem cruel and unkind because the poor thing is traumatized already. I think every true authentic hunter has a genuinely kind heart, and that's a real fact. We have compassion and appreciation for every living thing, which is why we hunt in the first place. We help manage deer populations. We enhance the natural habitat for indigenous animals. It's all very significant. I get where you're coming from, said Nick, and I wholeheartedly agree. But why did the Bigfoot steal our elk? Can you answer that conundrum? Possibly because they know or sensed we don't really need it. Because we have other food sources available for us at home that they possibly know about, whilst they rely on the food of the natural world to feed them completely. In a strange way, I feel good to have shot the animal with such precision, but I'm not bothered it was taken off us, as it's a lot of meat for the freezer, let me tell you. You have a point, said Nick, but what you're saying is that they're very clever, intelligent creatures. Yes, they are, I said. I feel it in my gut. They thought we didn't need the buck for food, and they're right about that. I mean, I enjoy venison to a degree, but in truth, I don't fancy living on it for the rest of the year. I like variety in my meat. But we could have given the meat away, protested Nick, to our friends. True, I said, but I'd rather the Bigfoot have it. They need it more than we do, especially in cold weather like this, facing those grievous winter conditions. I agree, said Nick. I considered this hunt of ours in Colorado to be the most memorable hunt of my life, and all these years later, I know the critters we encountered were most certainly Bigfoot. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, my name is Julian, although most people call me Jules for short. I'm from Kentucky, which is a southeastern North American state, bounded by the Ohio River in the north and the Appalachian Mountains to the east. The Kentucky countryside is utterly exquisite, with high ridges, V shaped, beautiful green valleys, dreamy forests, ravishing sunsets, and the state's highest point known as Big Black Mountain. We are also the land of coal fields and the birthplace of the quintessential Kentucky Fried Chicken, of which we are revered for all round the world. I grew up in a fine neighbourhood called Cherokee Gardens in the 80s, which is six miles east of Louisville in a very pretty green leafy suburb with parks and amenities close by. I grew up in a pretty little detached home that was built in the 1960s but had been renovated and refurbished in the late 70s before my mother ever bought the place. I would describe our house at the time as being like a whimsical, quirky cottage, which was really tiny yet quite uniquely charming in its own way, yet very much proficient for all our needs. It possessed a very modest, well-presented front and back yard, and the quintessential English country garden look about it that I found rather endearing. I moved into this cosy, cute little place when I was about 11 years old, as my parents decided to get a divorce, which completely devastated and confounded me, as I could not bear my precious family being torn apart like this, and I blamed my father for the split. My disloyal father, sorry dad, but it's true, had engaged in an affair with his secretary at work, and she was a flaky, flirtatious woman, young enough to be his own daughter. When my mother found out about the treacherous affair, she ended the marriage and my dad moved in with his sleazy, skanky younger secretary. It made me sick to my stomach seeing my father with this trollopy woman, and I was so blighted by anger because it felt like not only he had cheated insidiously on my mother, but on me as well, and it felt like we were both dejected and just not good enough for my father. I cannot tell you how much desolate hurt and anguished heartbreak that divorce actually caused me in my young life, and I do not think I ever fully accepted my father's duplicity, although I have forgiven him now that I am older and wiser and more attuned to the complexity of human relationships. Even so, I never understood why they divorced. I sought solace with a neighbour who lived next door to me, a young boy called Tom, who was one year younger than myself at the time and we became firm friends. It would seem that his parents had also got divorced at about exactly the same time as mine had done. Once again, it was the common denominator between us that we both shared, infidelity. I gather his father had been through as many promiscuous women as you and I have had hot dinners. 
Finally, his mother had just about as much as she could possibly take of her husband's philandering ways, and she filed for divorce. I gather he was utterly devastated and never saw the divorce train coming his way. Possibly he thought he would elude it all his life, but finally it caught up with him. I think the tattered, bedraggled and shredded remains or ashes, if you like, of what we had left of our families brought Tom and I together as friends, rather than two young boys choosing to hang out together out of choice. It was like we both related to the gutted state of affairs between us that we were both going through at such a tumultuous time in our lives. It was good to share my grievances like anger, grief and bitterness towards my father with Tom, who understood exactly how Dolores I was feeling. Fortunately for Tom, he somehow managed to bypass the anger stage of his parents' divorce and was now accepting his father's perfidious infidelity. I think possibly because his guileful father had been through women like a box of chocolate-coloured candies and he had become accustomed to his unscrupulous father's wandering eyes and foxy deviousness as much as the scrambled eggs on his breakfast plate every Thursday morning. I'm never going to be like my dad, he confided in me one day. He lost so much cheating on my mother. He lost absolutely everything. What do you mean, I asked. He threw the best thing he had away for a long line of immoral floozies, and now he's a lonely old man living on his own in the middle of nowhere, without even a dog for company. He hasn't got a thing. I know what you mean, I said. My mother told me that Dad had phoned her up recently, complaining that things aren't going too well with that licentious secretary of his, who he suspects may be cheating on him with a younger man. He begged my mum to take him back, but she refuses to give him a second chance. We are only kids, said Tom, and yet we can see how stupid they've been. It's like they always think the grass is greener on the other side. It's almost like we're the adults and they're the kids. I could teach my dad a thing or two, let me tell you. Fast forward a couple of weeks when Tom dropped a bombshell and revealed to me that his father had been found dead in his tiny little bungalow on a small plot of land in the Kentucky countryside. I could hardly believe it. I'm so sorry, I said. What happened? Well, the police think he was on the roof and fell off it and hit his head really badly. They say he didn't suffer at all, that his death was instantaneous. I'm sorry, I said. I don't know what else to say. As I didn't have much sympathy for Tom's father, but at the very same time, I was sorry for him to have lost his dad like this. Tom looked decidedly awkward for a moment, almost as if he was deciding whether he should tell me or not. And then he said to me that he needed to ask me a very big favour. I'm so afraid that if I ask you that you'll say no when I tell you the big juicy details. They're not very good, I'm afraid. Spit it out, I said. You can tell me anything. Well, remember when I went to see my father last weekend? Yes, I said. I remember. Well, something really bad happened, and I think that that is what caused my dad's death. Are you saying he didn't fall off the roof and that it wasn't an accident, I asked? That's exactly what I'm saying. You mean one of his ex-girlfriends finally finished him off, I teased. No, worse than that. Much, much worse. Well, tell me everything from the beginning, and don't miss anything, I insisted. Well, my father lives in a very small bungalow, said Tom. Well, he did, and it's heavily flanked by wood green. I've seen all kinds of remarkable wild animals running through the sylvan, like white-tailed deer, squirrels and rabbits. I love going into the woods there. There's a large stream that traverses through the valley, and it's ever so pretty. When I visit Dad, I like to spend time in the woods while he's working. So that's what I did on the last Saturday morning. It was such a beautiful day, with lots of birdsong in the valley, and the woods were so shaded because the trees are so tall and statuesque, and the ground is covered in lacy ferns. On this occasion I was sitting on a rocky outcrop, throwing stones in the water of the gushing stream, when something started hitting me with acorns. I mean, like, really pelting me very hard. It felt like I was being attacked. It wasn't a playful act. Maybe someone was playing a trick on you, I suggested. Who, said Tom? No one was there. Didn't you see anyone, I asked. Well, I saw something very huge in the undergrowth. I could tell it was absolutely massive, because I could see its outline. This thing was built like a giant. I could see its black silhouette. But I couldn't discern what it actually was, because the foliage covered it like a curtain, so it was hard to actually observe. 
It also smelt so disgusting that my nose began to burn and my eyes water, like when you get smoke fumes or something noxious in your eyes. It was like that. It made me choke and sneeze and cough. I was bricking myself. I was so frightened out of my wits. I started throwing stones in self-defence. And when I say stones, I mean big stones that I found lying by the stream. Then I heard it growl at me, whatever it was, and my heart leapt in my throat. It was the most terrifying sound that I've ever heard. It was like it reverberated right through my chest and caused my whole body to wobble under the vibration, much like a jelly, causing me to break out in a very cold sweat. You are freaking me out, I said. What on earth did you do next? Well, I did try to run, but at first my body behaved like a car without petrol. It just wouldn't start up. It was like my engine wouldn't move. It was the weirdest thing and sensation that has ever happened to me. It was like I froze to the spot. Why do you think that happened, I asked. I think it was because I was afraid. I clammed up for a moment. But when I did start to move, this thing began to run after me. And I actually wet myself. I was that terrified. Did you see what it looked like, I asked. Well, I got a glimpse of it. It was like this big, black, hairy monster with a gorilla-like face. It was ugly, grotesque and very evil. You are winding me up. No, I'm not. That is exactly what I saw, and I'm not making it up either. Well, what happened next? Well, I ran back to the house as fast as I could, and I bolted the door behind me. But I didn't tell my dad what I'd seen, because I knew he wouldn't believe me. He'd think I'd imagined things or I was making things up. Anyway, later that night, the monster came back and started banging, pounding and rattling the whole house, and it was stomping around on the roof and making a huge ruckus. I've never been so affrighted in my whole life. I ran to my father's room for solace and reassurance. Well, what did your father do? Well, he ran out of the house immediately and started firing shots at the critter that was standing on the roof, banging it with a big piece of timber. And when my father started to fire at it, it then ran away and retreated back into the woods. Did you see what it was? No, nor did my father. My father was so bewildered, he said he'd see never seen anything like that before, and he had no idea what on earth it could be. So you think the critter actually came back and pushed your father intentionally off the roof the following day after he dropped you back to your mother's house? Oh, I do, said Tom, looking at me with eyes as wide as saucers. I most certainly do. Well, I suppose it's possible, I said, but it could also have been an accident. What on earth was he doing on the roof anyway? Well, I think he was fixing some of the damage the critter caused, which was quite extensive. It messed the outside of his house. He was so upset about it, and he did say if that thing ever came near the house again, he would shoot it dead, in no uncertain terms. So what's this favour you wanted to ask me, I asked. I draw the line at coming to your dad's funeral. I hope you accept that. No, it's not that. My mother's going to put my dad's house on the market, as it's in my name, so theoretically it belongs to me. She wants to get the best price for it she can, so she plans to go back there and repaint the rooms. We're going to spend a week there, and I don't think I can do that alone, not with that monster loitering around in the woods. Of course I'll come, I assured him. I do not know why I agreed to spend a week at Tom's deceased father's house in the country, but I did. I wasn't about to backtrack on my promise, although part of me wished that I could. I guess I felt really sorry for him, as despite everything, he was gutted about his dad's death, although he was managing to hide it very well. I did sense he felt responsible for his dad's demise, as he emphatically believed that this strange monster had surreptitiously thrown his dad off the roof, which I thought was very unlikely, if not rather preposterous to say the least. I knew it was going to be a big job helping to repaint the home, but I wasn't adverse to a bit of hard work. Besides, it would be good to be there as a support for Tom, who was terrified of the monster he'd encountered. I knew he was too strung up emotionally to tell his mother about it. I couldn't really blame him, as I was finding his spurious erroneous story hard to believe myself. Honestly, I thought he'd probably encountered a bear or something and had highly exaggerated and amplified his account of what he'd seen. I did find Tom to be a very over-elaborate dramatic person, which was why he landed all the theatrical lead parts in school plays. It was clear he was a natural talent when it came to acting, but his spectacular dramatic prowess did have the propensity to filter over to his everyday life. 
Not that he wasn't trustworthy, of course, but things were always bigger and infinitely more extravagant to Tom in his colourful imagination or sense of recall than in the real world. I do remember him telling me a sensational story once about how this very dangerous, aggressive and vicious dog had launched a full-scale attack and bitten him at the park, and it was so very bad he had to get stitches at the hospital. I promise you the way he described this event and this dog that I was envisaging a rarely massive Rottweiler or something equally as intimidating. So imagine my amazement and surprise when he pointed to this very cute little white poodle that was tottering around the park with her dainty paws and tiny body. And Tom informed me that this was the aggressor that nearly bit his thumb off that day in the park. I remember I had to bite my tongue back to avoid cracking up with laughter. It was hysterical. And so it was I had agreed to spend a week with Tom in the country and to help his mother repaint the rather shabby house. In truth, I was looking forward to it in a way, as I did enjoy painting, and I thought it might be fun escaping to the country. I was not even remotely concerned about the monster Tom claimed to have encountered, and had long since forgotten about it. I could tell that Tom clearly could think of nothing else. I remember he was shaking violently the whole journey on the way to the house, and his mother kept asking him to stop rattling all the seats. I was to discover that Tom's deceased father's prosaic house was in the middle of nowhere and was incredibly remote and very isolated with a few farms scattered around here and there and then there was this tiny, almost pathetically small piece of land that belonged to Tom's deceased father. We drove down a very long rocky driveway until we parked outside a pretty unremarkable mundane-looking bungalow that personally I wouldn't have bothered transforming into a silk purse because it was beyond that. It was one of those pedestrian kind of houses you quite frankly would be better off bulldozing and starting all over again. It was very mediocre and rather bland, a brick home that lacked charm and personality and was really just a simple uninspired box filled with a few rooms. Before long we began to paint the rooms in some pretty bright colours as during the 80s colour was very much in fashion. The following day I asked Tom to join me in the woods for a walk and he absolutely refused point blank because he was certain the monster was in there and promptly reminded me why I had accompanied him to his father's place in the first place. I'm afraid I have to admit I didn't listen to Tom, as selfishly I rarely rather fancied exploring the Sylvan, and when Tom realised I was going in there alone, he decided to join me, not because he wanted to, but because he was feeling very protective of me. He was far from happy about this, and I could tell he was discomposed and fearful. I can't let you go in there alone. Why will you not believe me about that monster? Because you do tend to exaggerate ever so slightly, I said. I'm sure the monster you saw was a grumpy raccoon. Now you're just being mean, said Tom, looking exasperated. Before long we were walking in the Sylvan, and Tom had certainly not exaggerated the magnificence of this place. On the contrary, he'd not highlighted it enough or done it justice, or told me exactly how spectacular it was. I mean, it was breathtakingly beautiful, filled with oaks, red maples, sugar maples, hickories, elms and beeches, and I cannot find the words to describe or even to express to you how magical it was. It was like a world within a world, or like a secret enchanted garden that you entered through a magical door. In fact, it was so charming you could easily believe that you had been transported to another reality or another time, as everything was so perfect. You could hear the enchanting tweets and warbles of the bird song and the sound of water crashing over the rocks that almost sounded like the breakers of a turbulent sea. The canopy above our heads provided a shady retreat from the noonday sun, but prisms of light danced through the branches and leaves on the forest floor, creating the pretty light effects of a mirror ball at a disco, which meant that the plants were all dappled with different shades of intriguing lights. There were rabbits bounding across the splendiferous oasis and squirrels starting up trees and birds flying up into branches. Tom guided me towards the stream, and it was breathtaking. There was a massive waterfall that thundered down jets of white water from a great height, and there were rocky outcrops and a beautiful rock pool to swim in. I eagerly tore off my clothes, and in my boxer shorts I jumped into that cool water, and it was absolutely glorious, and Tom followed behind me. We began to laugh and chuckle as we splashed each other and swam around, and it seemed like Tom had long since forgotten his apprehensiveness. 
All of a sudden I noticed that there was something moving around the water swimming with us that looked like a long otter, but much bigger, and it appeared to be making human-like sounds, rather like laughter. I couldn't understand what on earth it was, because when I did actually see it more clearly, I was dumbfounded and befuddled, because it looked human-like with ape-like influences, and very similar in size to myself, with the most congenial brown eyes that I've ever seen. It was covered in long, shaggy black hair. Tom whispered to me, It looks like the big monster that chased after me, but it's much smaller, and this one is nice, not fierce and obnoxious like the big one was. There is nothing dangerous about him, Tom. Look how friendly he is, I said, ignoring my friend's concerns. We began to play in the water with this little critter, and he was so funny. We tossed pine cones at each other, playing a rather weird kind of Marco Polo, and we were all having so much fun, so much so that we almost forgot our physical differences, and even Tom warmed to the critter. Suddenly I sensed something was looking at us, and then I discerned it, and I nearly passed out in absolute shock. Never in all my life have I ever seen something more intimidating or terrifying. It was easily eleven foot tall, whatever it was, a thousand pounds and three foot wide, and it was covered in very long black hair, the colour of black coal, or the darkest raven's feathers you've ever seen. This thing was so colossal that it took my breath away. It was built for power, speed and strength, and was physically designed with the robustness and vigour of a rhino or an elephant. It possessed very long arms, and it had that primate-like look and very powerful sturdy legs that were bent at the knees. Its shoulders were massive, and its bicep muscles would impress the largest bodybuilders of our time. The head was incredibly distinctive and was shaped like a pyramid, and it tapered to the shoulders in a smooth sweep, and there was no neck apparent at all, and it was a very stocky muscular being. The grey leathery face was very broad but long, and the nose exceedingly wide and flat, and there was a distinctive furrowed brow ridge with very deep-set dark eyes. The two words that spring to my mind when observing this creature are human and ape rolled together, because these two physical characteristics were clearly discerned in his outer appearance. The critter stood there, and he had the meanest, most terrifying look on his face, and if looks could kill, he was wearing that look. I could tell his eyes were enraged and his nostrils flared, and when he breathed he sounded exactly like a horse. The next thing I knew was that he was thumping his chest with his fists and curling back his lips to reveal his human-like teeth that were infinitely superior in size to ours. The critter began to growl, and it was the most horrifying sound that I have ever heard. I began to shake like a leaf. I can't remember a time when I was more petrified, intimidated or overwhelmed by anything as I was now. All of a sudden, the critter who'd been with us darted out of the water, shook his shaggy coat like a wet dog, and ran up to the massive beast that I realised must be his father. He began to stroke his father's hair tenderly and reassuringly, like he would a dog, to calm him down. And then he began to chatter away to him intently, looking directly into his eyes and pointing towards us. It was like he was telling his dad that we were indeed his friends in a language that sounded rather like gibberish. I could see that the mean eyes began to soften and evaporate as quickly as steam from a kettle. I kid you not, as quickly as a flick of a light switch on and off was how quick the demeanour of this monstrous creature changed. One minute he looked like the devil, the next he looked like Archangel Michael. The change was utterly extraordinary, and the hostility of the critter was completely transformed in an instant, and then he nodded to us so warmly as if we'd always been the best of friends. The big creature even left us with his little one to continue playing in the water, which we did for a long while, and this incredible friendship lasted for the rest of that week. By the end of our stay we were so sad to leave. We had grown so fond of the little friendly critter, and even his father had come to watch us play from time to time. He would actually sit on the rocky outcrop and watch us with a look of great pleasure on his face, much like a father who was sharing in his son's happiness. It ended up being one of the best weeks of my young life, and Tom no longer regarded the large critter that had chased after him that day as a deadly monster, because we both warmed to the cantankerous crotchety old fellow. 
All these years later, I realised that the critters we encountered were Bigfoots, and whether the large male Bigfoot had anything to do with his un the untimely death of Tom's father, we will never really know the answer to that question. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Doreen and I'm from Washington State in the Pacific Northwest, but I'm originally from Calgary in Canada. My family moved to North America when I was about 10 years old. We settled in northwest Washington along the Potomac River in the 70s, and so invariably my memories of my life in Canada are pretty vague. I was raised in the historic area of Georgetown of Columbia County, which was a thriving port community in 1752. Georgetown is tightly compact, a neighbourhood steeped in its historic roots, with 18th to 19th century federal-style architecture and quirky little cobblestone streets. This spectacular, awe-inspiring area is surrounded by green spaces and pretty verdant parks. I really love the canal that extends 185 miles into the Cumberland, Maryland, through a series of pretty locks. I grew up in a quintessential renovated Victorian house here in Georgetown with my younger sister Diane and both my parents, and all this time I lived about one street away from my husband-to-be, and yet in those days we never ever crossed paths, not even once. I met my husband Gabriel on a perfectly clear sunny day that in an instant darkened, and suddenly the clouds burst open and it began to rain heavily. It would seem that the cotton dress that I was wearing was completely soaked, and my drenched hair was hanging in rat's tails around my face. I began rushing home from my walk in the park with my little Boston Terrier, Toya, feeling very exposed as we were caught up in the thick of this torrential onslaught. Gabriel, on witnessing my dishevelled state, stopped his car immediately and asked me if I'd like a lift. I was heartily glad to be rescued by this debonair gentleman and hastily took him up on his offer as Toya and I gratefully climbed into the back of his car, offloading pools of water onto his pristine white leather seats. I remember I cordially invited Gabriel in for a coffee as a way of saying thanks, and he accepted at once. I went to dry off and change my clothes, while Gabriel, using a towel, dried up Toya, my dog, and we began to talk over cups of steaming hot coffee. After our serendipitous encounter, we would meet up fairly regularly to walk our dogs in the park every single day. At that time, he had a mischievous beagle called Tommy, who loved to lift his leg up on everything. Gabes and I would enjoy walking and talking together, and so began the beginning of our magical love story. We were married in a very enchanting small baroque chapel in Georgetown in 1991, and then we moved into a really delightful old Victorian home, only about three blocks away from where I originally grew up as a young girl. My strange, incredulous story that ultimately led to my Bigfoot encounter all began with a rather novel, unconventional dinner party, and it was one I was not going to forget in a hurry. And it is a story Gabe still teases me about today incessantly, as it is forever marked in our memories with vivid recall and much humour. Gabriel is half Swedish, and so he'd started up a brand new company here in Georgetown, where he was introducing Swedish prefabricated self-assembly wooden sheds, chicken coops, tree houses, barns, and even small houses that were delivered to our customers in very large cardboard containers. It would seem that our aspiring, innovative business idea was going remarkably well. One day, Gabriel informed me that he'd like to invite the CEO and his wife from the company headquarters in Sweden over for a celebratory, illustrious dinner party. He wanted to make an eminent impression on them both and emphatically believed that I would wow them with my culinary prowess and my charm. I wanted our important dinner guest to see how serious we both were about this business enterprise of ours and to readily discern that we were the perfect couple to run the entire company from the ground up on the American side of things and that we had an ardent passion, enthusiasm, energy and dedication second to none. So there I was, agreeing to prepare an exceptionally glamorous, well-presented dinner party for our highly esteemed guests. I resourcefully decided upon the practicalities of planning an ingenious but delicious home-style menu and laying on a sumptuous spread. I was going to cook some of the 80s American favourites at the time and introduce the Swedish couple to chicken and mushroom volivants for hors d'oeuvres, followed by beef stroganoff with roast potatoes for the main course, and then, of course, plum torte served with homemade vanilla ice cream for dessert. 
I would swathe my dining room table with the finest resplendent golden tablecloths and matching napkins while showcasing my finest gold rim bone china dishes, sparkling crystal glassware and silver cutlery. I would deck the table with lavish ornate silver candlesticks filled with swanky gold candles and then I would fill the small crystal vases with an assortment of pretty rosebuds from lilacs to pinks and creams. I'd even gone off shopping in Georgetown to my favourite bohemian boutique to buy the quintessential rather zooty black dress with a slinking pair of high heels to match, and I knew I looked pretty good in my dashing ensemble, even if I say so myself. Now, if that wasn't enough, I'd even booked an appointment at the hair salon for the day in question to have my hair styled and my nails manicured with bright pink nail varnish. I was feeling galvanised with enthusiastic excitement about my first opportunity to become the quintessential domestic goddess that would make Martha Stewart look very prosaic, unoriginal and incredibly pedestrian by contrast. I could visualise it all so perfectly in my mind's eye. My Swedish guests would be mesmerised and spellbound by my delectable, delicious food, wondering whether I'd actually studied cuisine under the guidance of Gordon Ramsay. My husband would be bursting with pride to show off his incredibly snazzy, charming and very domesticated young wife, and our dazzled, beguiled and bewitched guests would be in such awe and very certain that there was no one more worthy in North America to command and preside over their up-and-coming Swedish company than we were. I'm going to make a brutally honest confession to you and your listeners, and that is that I'm a very untidy, messy person – and it is not uncommon for me to leave trails of jumbled clothes strewn over the bedroom floor, as I spend ages trying to decide what to wear. I've been informed that this is because I'm a typical Libran, which means I'm desperately indecisive, and I admit that this is true. I also loathe cleaning up after myself, especially washing dishes, and I'm predisposed to leaving the cluttered kitchen looking like a chaotic bomb has hit it, and that's an understatement. I have to tell you that Gabriel is a very methodical, fastidious and neat person and is often the one that cleans up after me. He doesn't understand how someone as petite as I am can make the house look as if it's been ransacked by thieves or invaded by a herd of disorderly, trampeding elephants who've clearly had a bad trunk day. On the day of the dinner party, I must have got my wires crossed with Gabriel because I falsely believed that I was hosting this elegant dinner party the following Monday and not on the day in question. The unorderly house looked higgledy-piggledy after the hectic weekend, and there were clothes literally carpeting the living room furniture, much like cascades of miniature throws, and there was also random garments lying strewn over the cream carpet in a kaleidoscope of bright colours. I vividly recall waking up this fateful morning with a thundering, thumping headache and the hangover from hell as Gabriel and I had drunk rather too much Pinot Noir the previous day. It was coming back to haunt me, much like the proverbial boomerang. When I have migraine headaches, they tend to hit me with the veracity of a raging electric storm that panels my head like a meat grinder on full throttle. I knew that this day was invariably a non-starter for me. The house was a deplorable mess, there was no food in the refrigerator, and I was incapacitated by this appalling nausea, drilling head and sensitivity to light. I knew that I would have to take it easy today and put the household chores and weekly shopping on hold. I gratefully returned back to bed and slept almost the entire day, waking up for a moment to answer a call of nature. I glanced at my dishevelled reflection in the mirror and was horrified by what I saw staring back at me. My pasty face looked whiter than a sheet and my tousled, draggle-tailed hair stood on end like a hedgehog and my blue eyes were contoured by the most hideous dark rims that reminded me of a raccoon. I looked a complete and total mess, but I didn't care because of my blinding intolerable headache, and reluctantly once again I retired back to bed. When would this god-awful headache go, I wondered. I was awoken at six in the evening to hear the doorbell buzzing. Oh, that must be Gabriel, I thought, groaning in annoyance. Why didn't he take his keys with him to work this morning, I thought angrily. Now I had to manoeuvre my body out of bed and unlock the door. I wasn't pleased about it at all. I stumbled out of bed, looking like a very grouchy, bad-tempered bull terrier, with my sleepy eyes in slits. I proceeded to open the front door, exclaiming, Why the heck didn't you take your keys with you this morning? To my horror, standing in the doorway was the very well-turned-out, dashing and debonair Swedish CEO, and his very stylish, glamorous and chic wife, 
both whom looked like they'd stepped out of a bandbox or had spent the entire afternoon with Vogue for the launch of a very glamorous fashion shoot. Well, there I was, by contrast, with my wind-blown, uncombed hair, looking as if I'd been dragged through a hedge backwards, wearing a grumpy expression on my face, along with a kiddie's pair of Snoopy pyjamas. How ridiculous did I look! I've never felt more self-conscious, humiliated and embarrassed in my entire life, as I ushered my bemused, bewildered guest into the living room, trying to smooth down my hair in the process and dashing around the living area like a bat out of hell, trying to pick up all the bedraggled clothes and stuffing them all into the hall cupboard as quickly as I could to make the place look less like a boudoir and more like a living room. Oh, I'm so sorry, said the lady. Have we arrived at an inconvenient time for you? She said, looking at me awkwardly, still in my pyjamas. Oh, of course not, I lied. I've been looking so forward to seeing you both all day. I'm just a tad disorganised, that's all. Well, don't worry about us, she said. We don't stand on ceremony here. We're very relaxed, she assured me. Well, may I say you look incredibly lovely, I said. You look like you're about to attend a dinner invite at Buckingham Palace. Not a simple dinner here in Georgetown with us. Oh, this old thing, she said, looking down at her exquisite red flowing dress. Oh, I've had it for years. It's nothing special at all. The woman then moved towards me and kissed me on both of my cheeks, handing me a massive exquisite bouquet of very expensive flowers and two bottles of the finest French champagne. Thank you, I said. That's very, very naughty of you. They're incredibly beautiful. Gabriel, please give our guests something to drink, I said, and put those lovely flowers in a vase, won't you? I'll be back in a tick. I raced into my bedroom as quickly as I could to brush my hair and throw on my black dress and a splash of red lipstick to make myself look halfway decent. I suddenly realised that the shock of seeing my guests on the doorstep had seemingly obliterated my headache, which had to be a good thing. I retreated to the kitchen where Gabriel was pouring out glasses of champagne for our guests. "'What the hell happened to you today?' he asked me, looking mortified. "'The house looked like it had been hit by a tornado.' And you look like you've been tossed in the eye of the storm. I know, I said. I didn't know the dinner party was today. What am I going to feed them? I've not got anything in the house at all. I said, opening the refrigerator and beginning to groan. Oh, no. I'm sure you can rustle up something, said my husband. I have full faith in your culinary prowess. And if the worst comes to the worst, I'll order takeout for all of us. I'm sure our guests won't mind, he said at all, giving me a big wink and planting an encouraging big kiss on my forehead. Oh, by the way, he said teasingly, you still look beautiful, despite the fact that you do look as if you have been ruffled up rather a lot. Always quite the charmer, I said, giggling. I scanned the contents of the refrigerator and sighed all the more. Oh, no, I could see that all I had was a cheese, milk and a few bedraggled pieces of salad. I decided I'd make some macaroni cheese for dinner, and I managed to whiz up some frozen raspberries which I mixed with champagne to make a fruit coulis which I served with tin peaches and vanilla ice cream, and actually it really was rather good. You would never have guessed that those peaches were actually tinned. It's amazing what you can rustle up if you actually put your mind to it. Before long, we were all seated at my mahogany dining room table, eating macaroni cheese, and my guests complimented me on my melt-in-the-mouth dish, saying it was the best mac and cheese that they'd ever tasted, and it seemed that I had redeemed myself somewhat. I have to admit it was delicious, so miracles do happen when we least expect them to. As our guests relax, we began to lose our inhibitions, especially after drinking lots of champagne, and we began to talk as if we'd known each other all our lives, and the formality and reserve dissipated, and so did the need to impress our guests. It seemed that the lovely Swedish lady called Astrid and her husband Lucas had been all around Washington State and remarked on the incredible beauty of the Pacific Northwest. You live in a very beautiful part of the world, they stressed. Do you realise how lucky you are? I think we do, I said, but I must admit it's very easy sometimes to take things for granted here. It seemed that our Swedish guests had visited many interesting places and they told us that they'd camped at Mount Rainier over a couple of days and had a wonderful time there. Oh, I agreed, that is indeed the most beautiful place. Gabriel and I have been there once or twice and we've lived here all our lives. It's pathetic that we haven't been there more often. 
You do know Mount Rainier is the highest volcanic peak bordering the United States and the largest alpine glacier outside of Alaska. Oh, I know that, said Astrid, but I understand it's also an active volcano in the Cascades that hasn't erupted in the last 460 years or so. That's right, I said, but even though it's potentially dangerous, isn't it absolutely glorious? Oh, yes, I was absolutely awestruck by how stunning it was. The trail was also magnificent, with waterfalls, streams, mountainous outcrops and silvery lakes, and the most gorgeous meadows of wild flowers with butterflies and bees everywhere. It was utterly enchanting. I was totally gobsmacked by how beautiful everything was. Astrid turned to her husband and said, "'Shall we tell them what we saw, dear?' "'Why not?' said Lucas. "'But it is an incredulous, rather outlandish story, I'm afraid, "'that you might find rather difficult to believe. "'So we won't be offended if you're sceptical about what we tell you. "'As if we were wearing your shoes, we wouldn't believe it either.' "'What did you see?' I asked, looking intrigued. "'We saw a strange kind of primate. "'What?' I said. "'But we don't get primates here in North America, "'unless one escaped from the zoo, and that is very unlikely.' Well, let me tell you the story, said Astrid. Lucas and I spent our first night in a tent at Mount Rainer and decided to get up really early before even the sun had come out to start our hike that day. It meant that we could make fast progress and get a lot of walking under our belts before the sun actually rose. It seemed like a really good idea for us as during the middle of the day it can get unpleasantly hot. So we arose at about 4.30. Boy, that is early, I said. It was, I know, but really worth all the effort. We wore headlamps and armed ourselves with flashlight and provisions. Actually, it was really rather lovely so early in the morning. Before long, the sun rose over the valley, and you could see the golden yellow of the sun enveloping the blue sky and casting its pretty shafts of light over the silvery lake that reflected all the alpine trees, creating a golden glaze on its sparkly surfaces. After a while it was almost like a switch had been flicked because the birds began to tweet and everything seemed to come so vibrantly alive with the orchestral sounds of the dawn chorus. We saw more wildlife than we'd beheld the previous day, possibly because it was so early in the morning. We noted a couple of chipmunks, two raccoons, squirrels and black-tailed deers. It was like while all the campers at Mount Rainier were fast asleep in their beds, it had become a bustling hive of activity very early in the morning. Suddenly we sighted a really striking red fox with a gloriously resplendent red coat and a puffed-up tail. Its back was turned away from us, and it wasn't physically aware of our presence. That was when I indicated to Lucas in a hushed tones and sign language to creep behind a large evergreen conifer so we could get a close view of the fox. We could see him just sitting down in the middle of the path, staring ahead of him, and then he began to sniff the air. For a while it seemed that he had smelt something on the wind that unsettled him, and then he bolted away as fast as he could, as if something had really ruffled his feathers. All of a sudden we were hit with this overpowering smell that was very acrid like ammonia or nail varnish remover, and it burnt the back of our throats and stung our eyes. I was just about to say, what the heck is that, to Lucas, when I suddenly heard this loud thumping sound. Whatever it was, it was causing the ground to shake, wobble and reverberate. It sounded like something hefty was galumping towards us, like a trampeding elephant. I do not know how to say this to you, but when I heard that noise, I knew that whatever was coming our way was colossal and exceedingly dangerous. You could feel the presence before you actually saw it. I know that sounds outlandish and crazy, but that is what it was like. And then we saw these two Herculean-sized creatures coming into our field of vision. And when I saw them, I was transfixed with shock, and I nearly passed out. I've never felt so lapified in all my life as I froze up and broke out into a cold sweat. I began to shake and shiver, and my hair was standing on edge. It was like my heart had jumped into my throat. It was terrifying, said Lucas, intervening. I mean, I've never been more spooked or dumbfounded by anything in my entire life. These things were gargantuan, weren't they, dear? Oh, said Astrid, words fail me to describe the size of these things. I think they were easily ten to eleven foot tall, nine hundred to a thousand pounds, and as wide as your front door easily. I was just so amazed that anything that large could stand upright on two legs with such agility, grace and dexterity. The critters looked like primates, but they also had human qualities to their appearance, 
especially in the finer features of their faces. Their intelligent expressions and the general body shape, but on a much larger scale, of course, were very human-like. They were covered in long, flowing, dark brown hair that was flecked with an auburn tint, and they had powerful, sturdy legs and very overlong arms. What would you say that their faces looked like, I asked? Well, I'd say they were quite human-like in a way, very, very expressive, but different at the same time. It's really rather hard to explain. They had dome-shaped heads that folded into the shoulders pretty seamlessly. I didn't actually discern a neck to speak of. The faces were wide but very long, and the noses exceptionally flat, and the mouth very big but thin, and the eyes deep-set and dark. What exactly were they doing? I asked. Well, this is where it gets rather odd. These two critters were actually arguing, much like humans do. You could tell by the maddened tone of their excitable voices, and the way that they were looking at each other with eyes that could kill like angry daggers. They kept pointing fingers at each other indignantly, in an accusatory way like you or I might do if we were blaming someone for something. I could sense that they were both squabbling, and they kept quarrelling in the strange language, speaking backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards over and over again. Sometimes they even interrupted each other. Then one critter lunged towards the other and began tugging furiously at something that was in the other critter's hands. I realised immediately that they were fighting over a dead chipmunk. We watched in awe as the critter with the chipmunk sat under a tree against the trunk to eat his chipmunk, while his friend drooled as he watched him chewing every mouthful. He looked so tortured, and it was like he was hanging around for some crumbs or hoping in the off chance that the critter might concede and give him a bite, but that didn't look as if it was likely to happen. That was when Astrid did something really mad, said Lucas, interrupting. My wife has a mushy heart. Sometimes she can't help herself, even to her own peril, it would seem. What did you do? I asked. Well, in my rucksack, I just happened to have a large bunch of bananas, would you believe? I had brought it to snack on, and so I slid the bananas along the ground very stealthily, as quietly as I could, where they landed several feet away from the critter. I thought she'd blown our cover, said Lucas, but she hadn't because it was like the empty-handed critter just began to sniff the air. It was as if he could smell something suddenly. And that was when his eyes glanced down upon the bananas, and he rushed over and grabbed them. He began to dance jubilantly and make whooping sounds. Whoop! 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 It was like that. <laughs> I tell you, his reaction was like a kid at Christmas opening his dream gift. I've never seen anything so happy. He was over the moon and swinging the bananas backwards and forwards, literally doing his best to get the other critter's attention, as if to say, look what I've got, and it's all mine. The critter eating the chipmunk stopped very suddenly. He looked up at the critter with an astounded expression on his face, as if to say, where did you get those from? This time he was the one that was drooling. <laughs> so that was very funny. He began to offer his chipmunk to the critter in exchange for just one banana. The critter with the banana gave him one banana for the dead chipmunk and sat in the corner eating the rest of the bananas along with the dead chipmunk. He looked like the cat that had got the cream because he'd rarely scored. He was in heaven. We watched those human critters for a while and then we heard the voices of hikers coming down the trail and those things were gone like grease lightning. I was so gutted. They didn't want to be anywhere near the humans. Oh, but at least we got to see them, I suppose. I wonder what you saw, though, I said. So do we, said Lucas. I'd really love to know. Do you believe us, he asked. Of course I believe you, I said. I'm glad to tell you that despite the Snoopy pyjamas, bedraggled hair, messy home and pretty basic food that we offered our guests, we became great and firm friends with Lucas and Astrid over the years. I gather that they were as nervous about meeting us as we were about meeting them, and me appearing in my pyjamas rarely helped her to relax. We were very lucky that we were successfully able to take charge of the Scandinavian part of the business on the American side, with a great deal of success, I might add. Fast forward to about 2007, and then I had long since forgotten Astrid and Lucas's story by then, about the critters that they had encountered at Mount Rainier National Park. At the time I was training for a marathon, and I cannot abide going to a gym and running on a treadmill staring at a white wall. That just isn't for me. 
So I'd get up early and go running around a local park here in Washington that is full of western hemlocks and ponderosa pines and Douglas firs and spruce trees, and it has lots of walking, running and hiking trails. And so one day as I was running up a hiking path, I was hit by a pine cone and it stopped me dead in my tracks because I knew that the pine cone had not just dropped from the tree but had been deliberately targeted at me. There was no one on the hiking trail and I was flummoxed. Then another pine cone came flying at me, hitting me directly on the shoulders. I turned around and looked absolutely everywhere and yet I saw nothing and was exceedingly perturbed. And then again I was hit by another flying pine cone and this time it was on the leg. And then I heard what I can only describe as muffled laughter, almost as if someone was trying to block their laughter and suppress it, but they were clearly laughing at me. That's not funny, I shouted. I know you're there. And then that was when I saw a black shadow peeping at me through the tree line, so I ran around the corner to get a better view. And that was when I saw the creature that Astrid and Lucas had described to me years earlier, only this one was auburn in colour, and looked at me with these very amused golden eyes. Despite its good humour and seemingly docile nature, I was so stunned by what I was seeing that I literally froze to the spot and just stared at the creature with a look of complete bewilderment on my face. The critter threw one more cone at me, laughed again, and then glided away into the woods and was gone from my sight. I went home and was trembling so much it took me ages to compose myself. Gabriel said to me, "'What on earth is the matter with you? "'You look as if you've seen a ghost.' "'I remember saying to him, "'It may well have been a ghost, "'for I have no idea what I saw.' "'Fast forward to about 2005, "'and my husband and I were relaxing "'watching a television programme together "'all about mysteries in North America. "'Someone had drawn a picture of a Sasquatch "'that they had seen, "'and I said to Gabriel that this is what I had seen "'that day when I went running in the woods.' And that is what I believe that Astrid and Lucas must have seen at Mount Rainier National Park. It was Bigfoot. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is George and I've been building homes since I was 18 years old, much like my father and my grandfather before me. And I've constructed all kinds of homes from whimsical log cabins to wood homes, self-assemblies and brick homes, as well as renovating people's properties, modernising them or refurbishing them back to their original pristine condition. You name it and I've probably turned my hand to it with as much gusto and enthusiasm as a kid opening a Christmas present, as such is my passion for what I do. I've always been a pioneering spirit with creative and revolutionary ideas. Even on family beach holidays as a young boy, instead of surfing the waves, I would be building ingenious castles in the sand. So I think building things has always been in my blood, and I was always a dab hand with Lego blocks, I have to tell you. I have worked in building projects pretty much all over Appalachia, most especially West Virginia, Maryland, South Carolina, Georgia and Ohio, although I have built a couple of homes in Pennsylvania as well. My family has a home base in Georgia where we have a small plot of land all of our own and a pretty little red brick house that was actually inspired by a random trip to Barcelona where I fell in love with a red brick house I saw there and came back to recreate the stunning masterpiece myself. It's a very pretty home and the red brick does a lot to enhance the sumptuous rich greens of the shrubbery, trees and grass. Our house is an idyllic place surrounded by exquisite views where we raise free-range chickens, a couple of horses and grow our own vegetables. During the week, my wife spends her time at home raising our two young children, Tammy and Garth. I always return home for the weekends to spend as much time as possible with my family, which is imperative as my children will grow up so quickly and I want to enjoy every moment of their childhoods and not miss out on a thing. During the week, I live in my RV, which is really a great deal more comfortable than staying in hotel rooms, as it is my home away from home. I must say I enjoy the versatility of being able to move around from job to job in my home on wheels, so to speak. It's incredibly comfortable, as after a day's hard work, doing physically exhausting and gruelling work, I'm certainly not up to travelling long distances. And even if I was, it would be impossible to get to work on time with the very early starts at the building site. Wherever possible, I do enjoy the privilege of living on the site, and most of my clients like the security and convenience 
of having someone on hand all the time. My strange, incredulous story began when I was asked to build a property in the Blue Ridge Mountain area, close to Ash County. I'd been given the job to build the farmhouse through a highly esteemed architect friend of mine, whom recommended my services to the client, a lady called Mrs. Colbert. It would seem that Mrs. Colbert had purchased a great deal of land. She wanted to build her dream home for her family. She had also chosen the perfect spot for the location. The original 1800s federal-style farmhouse that still stood on the premises was being preserved. The family was still living in it while the building work progressed. But Mrs. Colbert was going to move her sister's family into the original farmhouse once the project was complete, and then her family would finally move into the brand new home that we were creating for her. Well, that was the plan anyway. I understood that Mrs. Colbert and her sister's family were exceptionally close and wanted to share the same piece of land. And why not if you can afford to? It was very much an exciting job, challenging and creative, and required skill and expertise. A knowledge of history and architectural plans specifically designed to complement the original federal-style architecture. I work with a team of very talented, skilled, expert builders and everyone was exceedingly excited about the job at hand as it was situated on a vast acreage of land surrounded by exquisite panoramic mountain views, sculptural rugged outcrops, pretty open prairies, vast areas of natural ubiquitous woodland, silvery ponds, enchanting creeks and a glorious stream that meandered through the heart of the wood green. I had been given permission by the kindly Mrs. Colbert to park my RV on her land and live in this idyllic spot while the building project commerced, and I was happy about the prospect of manning the fort and enjoying the benefits of the pretty open countryside, fresh mountain air and mesmerising views while I was at it. And so began the challenging but awe-inspiring building project, with bulldozers and hydraulic excavators to create trenches, holes and foundations. We created a very sizable clearing of flattened land and to the rear of the property several hundred yards from where we planned to build a large wraparound porch was a very pretty pond that was flanked by cascading willows and then stretched out to a vast resplendent looking sylvan. Mrs Colbert liked the idea of drinking pina coladas with her family while watching and observing the indigenous wildlife that frequented the pond for an early morning drink. She was a passionate animal lover and was particularly fond of deer and she also loved interesting bird life, most particularly birds of prey like ospreys and eagles. The moment we began digging, I sensed we were being watched by unseen eyes, but this was not the first time I'd experienced such unusual phenomenon. Once on a building project in North Carolina, we had endured similar things, where unearthly, eerie paranormal phenomena were perceived. We certainly sensed the whole time that invisible eyes were studying us, which had always been very discomposing for us. We would hear strange apparitional talking that could never be discerned, as the phantom-like voices seemed muffled and far away. But sometimes we would hear our names being called, and that would invariably freak us all out, and send chilling shivers down our spines, and some of my workmen had bailed on me, as they were so traumatised by the spine-chilling events. If that wasn't hauntingly unsettling enough for you, some of us were even physically touched by invisible hands. But when we invariably turned around to see who tapped us, no one was standing there. So I was feeling more than a little creeped out, especially by the familiarity of harrowing memories from a building job that I would so much sooner forget. I pushed those thoughts back to one side and told myself to stop indulging my imagination with these crazy ideas and to focus on the job at hand. Yet despite my very best efforts, I failed to relinquish the spooky feeling that I was being watched. When I glanced towards the sylvan very briefly, I was almost certain that I had detected the silhouette of a dark shadow peering at me from behind a tree. Now I was really getting carried away in my imagination, I thought very angrily to myself. Suddenly Sid, who was managing the hydraulic excavator, stepped off the machine for a moment, saying that he had spotted something buried beneath the ground, and that was when we realised we'd dug up an old gravesite. We had unearthed the body of a massive giant humanoid skeleton that was exceptionally large and much bigger than a human's, with very long leg bones and a thick conical skull that was full of very sizable teeth, far larger than your average man. 
I heaved a huge sigh of deep frustration. This was a massive setback because we would have to call the sheriff out in case there was anything nefarious or underhanded about our discovery. This had the potential to hold back our building project for weeks or even months on end, especially if the area was deemed to be a crime scene. I asked Sid, who was a man of few words, to call out the sheriff for us. We all stood over the gravesite, staring at the body in disbelief, or rather the skeleton, should I say, wondering if we were about to unearth some more nasty, insidious surprises from beneath the earth. Suddenly we saw this massive boulder, and when I say massive, I mean massive. It was easily about five foot wide, six foot tall, and incredibly heavy, and it was rolling down the valley at a very fast speed and all three of us on the site automatically ran to stop it because it was tumbling towards my RV and could have potentially caused a great deal of damage. Luckily, the rock did stop, and it failed to move any further and was positioned several yards away from my parked RV, or mobile home, if you like. Robin just gawked in astonishment and said, What the heck? How in God's name could something like this happen? It defies rational explanation. We were amazed by this extraordinary event because to push something this large and this heavy would take brute, almost superhuman strength. Where on earth had the boulder come from? And who on earth had pushed it? I looked towards the wood green to see if I could see anything or anyone standing there, but there was nothing in sight. Everything was very still. Someone or something must have pushed this massive stone, said Sid, looking flummoxed. And where did it come from? All of us looked at the woods to see if we could see any more signs of movement, but everything was suddenly so airily still, it actually sent shivers down my spine, and my hair was standing on edge. I felt as if something was not quite right deep in my gut, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. Something is definitely watching us, piped Robin, looking at me with wide eyes. Please to God may this not be another building development that stirs up malevolent spirits. I don't think I could go through that all over again. Last time it happened, I literally needed trauma counselling. Feeling emotionally dishevelled and somewhat disturbed by the curious incongruous sequence of events that had just transpired, with perplexed feelings of bewilderment, we finally returned back to the gravesite, and to our absolute amazement and utter horror, the bones had seemingly just vanished and disappeared into thin air. I mean, how does that happen? I had no comprehension of what had just transpired and began to think it was something paranormal that was out of our realm of understanding. I mean, I couldn't put it down to anything else, as it didn't make any logical sense at all. How could a gargantuan boulder come thundering down at a hill at such a fast speed, all on its own accord? And how on earth did a skeleton just totally dissipate into thin air, no longer to be visibly seen? When the sheriff arrived, I was heartily relieved to discover that Sid, my builder, who had a vocabulary of only a few words, had lived up to his reticent, evasive reputation. It appeared that on his telephone call to the sheriff's office, he had been very vague, indefinite and inexplicit, informing the sheriff to get to the building site at Fairfields at once, leaving the sheriff high and dry and not even clear about who had actually called him. This was exceedingly fortunate as far as I was concerned, it meant that I didn't have to mention the skeleton that we had uncovered that had vanished before our eyes. I can only imagine how crazy we would have sounded at such a peculiar revelation. What's up? said the sheriff, getting out of his car and closing the door behind him. I received a call to come out here. Really, I said, acting very surprised. Did anyone around here call the sheriff? I said, looking around with shark eyes that clearly said, don't say anything, or I might just bite. We all shook our heads in unison. No, sorry, Sheriff, we never did call you out. The ample-sized, well-rounded Sheriff stroked his grey, wispy moustache pensively, in an introspective way, almost as if he was deeply engrossed in his own thoughts on the matter. He shook his head, looking ever so frustrated and rather put out. Kids, he said, who would have them? always up to their crafty little tricks during the school holidays, phoning me up to get me running around the place like a headless chicken. For some reason, they think it's terribly funny to keep calling me out on these fake emergencies. I think I've a pretty good idea who the scheming little culprit is. The boy's mother needs to teach her son some manners, 
and to send her kid to summer camp, to get some sense knocked into that hair-brained head of his. He spends his time getting up to all kinds of trouble in the holidays, with nothing better to do with his time. If that mother doesn't watch him, he'll end up in jail one of these days, the little bugger. You know the saying, the devil makes time for idle hands. You must be right, Sheriff, I agreed. I'm sure it was that kid just winding you up and having a laugh at your expense. We breathed a sigh of relief as we watched the sheriff get back into his car and drive away. I could see that he looked less than amused and sneakily suspected that he'd been called out on a donut break and was less than thrilled to be summoned away from the sweet, delectable treats that he'd been looking forward to enjoying with a piping hot cup of coffee this morning. Woo, that was close, sighed Robin. Well, at least the disappearing skeleton means that we can pretend we never saw it and get on with the building. And so, invariably, that is exactly what we did. Two months passed and things were going exceedingly well on the building project and we were way ahead of schedule and had long since forgotten the incident with the skeleton. As since its mysterious, erroneous disappearance, the strange feelings we'd once experienced of feeling watched had long since dissipated and been forgotten. It would seem that we were no longer being blightened or hampered by paranormal events, which was a monumental relief for the all of us. One afternoon when we finished work early, I decided to take a light stroll into the Sylvan, and Robin agreed to join me. It was a lovely day. We took an ice bucket with us containing ice-cold beers and a few sandwiches. We ambled into the wood green, as Mrs Colbert had told us that the stream in there is so beautiful and was an exquisite spot to enjoy a picnic. As we walked through this bewitching, beguiling treed oasis, I really began to regret that I hadn't explored the spot before, because it was so magical, and was almost as if we'd stepped into an epic, whimsical, enchanting fairy tale world that was as pretty as a picture. The trees were tall, towering, statuesque giants, many with remarkable gargantuan trunks that were covered in carpets of velvety green moss, and the canopy above our heads was like an exquisite parasol, and it allowed just enough shafts of sunlight to dance through the branches, dappling the forest floor in various shades of speckled light. The forest floor was covered with pretty ferns and moss-covered boulders, and there was a few shade-loving flowers splashing the valley in kaleidoscopes of pretty colours. We could hear the soothing sounds of the water cascading down the rocky outcrops, and we could also hear the chirps and warbles of the uplifting bird's song. We ventured towards the stream and marvelled at the waterfall that jetted down this craggy, rugged outcrop with torrential floods of white water that flowed into the beautiful brook. Robin and I found a vast area of smoothed-out, flattened rocky crag that overlapped and jutted over the edges of the stream, much like a vast table ledge, and it was the quintessential spot to spread out our sumptuous picnic whilst enjoying the bedazzling views over this idyllic, flowing watercourse. We hungrily ate our delicious tuna sandwiches and downed our beers thirstily. None of us said a thing, as indeed no words needed to be spoken. I think we were both equally transfixed and mesmerised by the exquisite beauty of this pretentious, legendary place. All of a sudden I heard a thumping sound, and the only way I can describe that sound to you is it was rather like something was hitting a tree very hard, almost like the knocking of a hammer being pounded against wood. Everything became very still for a moment, and that was when we heard this very heightened buzzing noise that became alarmingly intense. That was when we observed these two massive dark hairy silhouettes that at first glance seemed to look rather like bears sprinting towards the stream at lightning speed with five-foot strides on powerfully strong legs. They were being aggressively assaulted by an angry cloud of black buzzing bees that had launched a full-blown frenzied attack on the two critters. These curious-looking creatures dived beneath the water's surface, and many of the frenetic, feverish bees that I noted were attached to their long black shaggy coats in a large sea of buzzy movement was now drowned in the water, while others flying in the air seemed to suddenly disperse and scatter as the two dark figures just suddenly disappeared and vanished from sight. The hysterical, excitable bees quieted down considerably, but still seemed rather confused, because there were no more targets to attack. For a while, everything became calm, peaceful and quiet, and I couldn't see anything at all, as the cloud of bees just disappeared, rather like a shadow of dark, speckled smoke. It would seem that the tranquil, gushing water hushed 
as everything became deathly still. After about three to five long minutes, two drenched heads popped out from under the water, where they had successfully held their breaths for quite some time. They began to make some excitable whooping sounds and were splashing around in the water exuberantly. It was clear that they were very happy about something. Then one of the critters climbed out of the stream very quickly to return only moments later with a massive honeycomb in his hands. And both the creatures sat in the shallow end of the stream, eating honeycomb in the water together. I realised that these two critters had been raiding a nest of wild bees, and although they were covered with hair, there were vulnerable areas on their skin, most especially their face, knees and sides of the torso under the arm area, where the hair was less dense, that appeared to have developed some bumpy inflamed patches from the attack of the stinging bees. Nevertheless, they seemed unfrazed and undaunted by the harrowing experience that they had just been through. These critters began to make the most orgasmic sounds as they enjoyed the honey. They looked like they were in heaven eating the sweet nectar, which dribbled down their faces and onto their hands, and I watched in awe as they licked the honey off their thick sausage-sized fingers. In all my born days, I don't believe that I've ever observed anything eat something with such gusto and relish. I think advertisers for honey products would hire them on the spot to advertise their honey, because I remember thinking to myself, boy, does that honey look good. Oh my God, said Robin, looking at me in amazement. I think they're Bigfoot. The words hit me like a punch in the guts, because my little daughter was passionate about Bigfoot, and I had assured her not to believe the spurious accounts on television. I told her that they were all make-believe, as Bigfoot was indeed not real. My wife had chastised me considerably and told me off for spoiling my child's whimsical belief in the hairy critter. She wants to believe he's real. Don't spoil her fun. You rarely are a wet blanket, she told me. You have no memory of what it's like to be a child. Let them dream, for goodness sake. Now here I was eating humble pie because I became horrifyingly aware that Bigfoot was indeed real. I was so stunned by this extraordinary revelation that I believe my fear was hijacked by shock, as seeing something you don't believe exists in our reality is very difficult to get your head around. Robin and I quickly took cover behind a rocky outcrop while we continued to watch the Bigfoot, who were completely oblivious to our presence, I'm glad to say. The two critters must have been about seven foot tall and about six to hundred pounds, with very lean muscular legs and overlong arms. Their torsos were stocky and solidly built, and the size of their shoulders were very gargantuan. They were covered in long, flowy, sandy-coloured hair, and their heads were the shape of pyramids that seemed to fold into the shoulders in a sweeping flow, with no evidence of a neck to speak of. The hairless, leathery, olive-skinned faces were long, and the jawline square with a prominent, distinguished brow ridge, flat nose, thin mouth and very deep-set golden-brown eyes. I can see why people describe Bigfoot as an ape-like humanoid, as I'm certain he does possess human and ape DNA. But I'm not an expert in these matters, nor do I claim to be. I'm not sure if I was correct, but I was pretty certain that the Bigfoots that we observed were actually quite young. I got that impression by their jubilant, youthful, mischievous energy, but I could of course be wrong. I did discern that they were taking their time to eat the honey, as they wanted to savour every single mouthful, and I thought that showed great intelligence and discernment on their part. There was no rush for them to gobble it all up at once, and they were eager to take their time. The critters sat in the shallow water for ages, rather like my wife does when she eats mangoes in the bath to avoid getting the sticky juices all over her. Maybe that's what the Bigfoots were trying to do. All I know is that Robin and I were so transfixed and amazed by what we were observing that we barely noticed the sun setting and the darkness rolling across the valley. And that was when I realised it was getting dark and late. The critters were still playing in the water together when we sneaked away and left them. Luckily we managed to make our way back to my RV, where I persuaded Robin to sleep in my spare bed. I just knew that I wanted to talk the whole night about what we'd seen and perceived. I couldn't share my experience with anybody else, so he was the one I wanted to talk to about it. Who else would ever believe our story? As Robin and I began to talk, we both reflected back to the very first day that we had found the large skeleton in the ground, 
and we began to put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together and got a clear picture of what really had happened. We are both absolutely certain that the skeleton we found buried beneath the ground was not human at all, but rather that of a large Bigfoot, based on the elongated skull shape and the size of the skeleton. We had sensed that something had been watching us when we began bulldozing the area. I now believe emphatically it was a worried family of Bigfoot that were highly concerned we were digging up the remains of a long-lost relative. As a result, they created a diversion by rolling a massive boulder towards my RV so that all my builders were distracted by the incident and diverted from the gravesite. It would seem that Bigfoot had rescued the bones from the ground while we were momentarily distracted. They possibly reburied those bones somewhere else. Robin and I were now certain that this is what had transpired. We were in awe at the intelligence of these creatures who are so successful at remaining elusive, evasive and invisible. We had watched them on this afternoon successfully recover a large honeycomb from a bunch of frenzied bees. My guess is that they'll possibly keep going back for more, as I very much doubt they destroyed the whole nest. They're too clever for that. Robin and I also marvelled that we hadn't actually been scared the whole time. We most certainly should have been, but it would be hard to imagine the joyful critters becoming aggressive towards us, as they were so high on sugar. Robin informs me that when his wife gets very grumpy, he will buy her something very rich and sweet and sticky, much like a chocolate brownie, and he says it works like a charm every time in putting his wife into a good jovial mood. No wonder they say that sugar is as addictive as cocaine. I think possibly we sensed the Bigfoots were no threat to us based on their good mood, but maybe things would have been remarkably different for us if we had faced Bigfoot on a rather bad day when his stomach was empty. I know if I haven't eaten, I get very grouchy, but once my belly is full, I'm one happy man. Could Bigfoot be as predisposed towards mood changes as much as we are that could ultimately affect the kind of encounter we might have with the critter should our paths cross? After our project was finished, I always reflected on the Bigfoots we saw that day. Robert and I get together from time to time to discuss it, but until now we've not shared our story with anybody else. He did give me permission to share my story with you, though. I did, however, tell my daughter once that I believe Bigfoot might be real after all. My daughter was incredibly delighted, and my wife even gave me a hug. That's much more like it, she said. I do like it when you humour the kids. It's a very nice thing to let your children dream, you know. So there you are. That's my story. My word! Who would have thought that Bigfoot would have had such a sweet tooth and want to go after the honey? He's more clever than we think. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus, and I really do hope you enjoyed it, because that's the whole idea about it, is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night.